coming out of church. And, and you'll see in a minute uh, where somebody really did literally fall out of church. If you have your Bibles or if you wish to follow over ahead, let's look at the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. You may not even know this story was in the Bible. A little remote story. We don't know a whole lot about uh, Eutychus, but we know this much. Starting with verse 7. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, meaning the apostle Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. He preached until midnight. Don't ever complain about me going too long, okay? He preached till midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in the window, now you've got to get the picture of this, okay? In the window sat a certain young man by the name of Eutychus. He was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as the apostle Paul continued preaching, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now picture him sitting in a window, three stories high. The apostle Paul is preaching. And like some of you all over the years, you just, just nod a little. And there he is in that window sill, and he's nodding while the apostle Paul is preaching, preaching to midnight, okay? And he fell. He fell out. And he fell for dead, okay? But Paul went down. He fell upon him and embraced him saying, do not trouble yourselves. Life is in him. Now when he came up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive. And they were not a little comforted. I guess they were a lot comforted by that. So here's a man that fell out the window, literally fell out of church. Was dead, but they brought him back to life. Let me share with you a letter that a pastor received from a church member. Dear pastor, you often stress attendance at worship as being very important for a Christian, but I think a person has a right to miss Sunday worship now and then. I think every person ought to be excused for the following reasons and the number of times indicated. First being Christmas the Sunday before or after for traveling purposes. And then there's New Year's. Sometimes the party just lasts too long. And there's Easter. We really have to break away for the holidays. And then there's July the 4th. That's a national holiday. And then there's Labor Day. We just simply need to get away. And then there's Memorial Day. We need to visit the family and we need to have barbecue together. Then there's spring break. After all, the kids do need a break. And then school opens. There's one last fling before school starts. And then there's those family reunions. There's my family reunion. And then there's my wife's family reunion. And then we, you, you need to allow two Sundays for sleeping late because of those late Saturday night activities. And then there can be those deaths in the family. That's an average of two per year. And then there's the anniversary. You know, that's when my wife and I go out on the uh, second honeymoon. And then there, there's sickness. That's one per family member. And then we've got those business trips. That's a must. There's those vacations. Uh, we've got to allow three uh, a year for that. And then there's bad weather. There's ice. There's snow. There's rain. Sometimes it's just cloudy out. And then there's the ball games. Six per season. And then there's the unexpected company. You just can't walk out on them when they come in. And then there's a time change. Spring ahead, fall back. And then there's those specials on TV like the Super Bowl and the World Series. Now, Pastor, that leaves two Sundays per year. So you can count us being on in church on the fourth Sunday in February and the third Sunday in August unless providentially hindered. Sincerely, a faithful 
church member. Well, I think you can see the humor in that, but ironically, there may be some that really live by that. Honestly, I don't know of anyone that would do that here in our church, but I know that there's plenty of people in our church and in any church that can work up any kind of excuse for not being in church. Now, in our scripture reading today, this setting that, that we see right here, this event actually took place on a Sunday. The assembly, the assembly of people there had gathered together and it really wasn't much different, I wouldn't think, than what we are experiencing here today. We gather to worship, we gather to pray, and to give God praise and glory. And there's this man by the name of Eutychus who sat in this window. He fell out of the window after the preaching got so long. Scripture says he died, and I looked at the Greek text on this. He did die, apparently, but they revived him. Now let's look at this story a little more intently as we look at where we are as a church, where we are as an individual, and how we may just find ourselves lulling ourselves to sleep. I think any church would tell you that there's two categories of church members. There are the active members, and then there are the inactive members that we have on the church row. Periodically, I go through that church row, and I look at those. And I pretty much know whether they are in that category of being an active member or an inactive member. Guess which one of those two lists is bigger? It's the inactive. I mean, we've got people on the church row that have been on church row for years. And they've not even darkened the door of any church, let alone ours. Now, for the most part, as I think about this and I sit down and my mind wanders about things, when people quit church, it's usually not something that is a quick decision. It's because of things that happen over a period of time. And then finally they wake up one Sunday morning and say, I just don't think I'm going to go to church. So they miss, and then they miss another Sunday, and then they miss another one down the road, and nobody ever called to say anything about it, so when they wake up and realize, hey, we're not in church anymore. Now we see here in verse 7 that there's the gathering of God's people. And you may want to follow a, a short outline that I have on the back of the bulletin there. Notice that they met on the first day of the week. They met on Sunday upon the first day, Scripture says there. Now, Sunday was certainly very important to the New Testament church. Jesus Christ arose. He was resurrected on Sunday morning. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It is the Christian's Sabbath. And I always look at Sunday as being a holy day. Now, folks, I remember, and I have to go back in my childhood, but I remember when Sunday was a very special day. It was honored and it was revered as a holy day. But now, for the most part, Sunday is just another day. Our activities on Sunday really don't differ from much of the things that we do any other day of the week. We want to wash the car, that's fine. If we want to go to the flea market, and that's fine. If we want to work, we want to change the oil, we want to mow the lawn, anything. I, I, what I'm saying is, and I'm not saying I wouldn't do some of those on some of those days, uh, on, on a Sunday. Most of the time I don't. But what I'm saying is there used to be a day that was set apart, that was seen as reverent, it was holy, it was a special day, it was dedicated to the Lord. And now we have very little, if any, distinction. Many of you can remember a day when most businesses were closed on Sunday. I see several heads shaking in the affirmative. I remember as a little kid hearing about the blue laws. Nobody knows what the blue laws are anymore. But businesses were closed, except for hospitals and other emergency places. In fact, I think it was Delbert, and I'll have to ask him when he gets here uh, today, assuming they're not out of town in Springfield. I think it was dealt with the time they were at the mall one Sunday, 
And of course, Chick-fil-A is always closed on Sunday because Truett Cathy, from the very beginning, I had an opportunity of meeting Truett Cathy at Ridgecrest because he sponsored kids there every year. And from the very beginning, it's always closed on Sunday because in his mind, and rightfully so, Sunday was a very sacred day. But somebody went to get something there at Chick-fil-A, there in the mall on that Sunday, and guess what? They were closed. And there was some lady griping and come. I can't believe this. They're closed on Sunday. Well, obviously that lady didn't know the story and probably didn't have much respect and seeing Sunday as being a very holy and sacred day. Now, if you're a Christian and you come here every Sunday, then you know something about starting your day in church with God's people having corporate worship. But as I alluded to a few minutes ago, there's a long, long list of excuses while many of our own people aren't here. And I know that today is, 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 a, uh, is a holiday weekend. You know, deer season started yesterday. Uh, I understand that, okay? That, that, is, that is holy in Owen County, okay? But um, that, that ought to be on. I'll probably be out there with at least one or two of our own people out there trying to get something. I've, all I've done over the years is just try in, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 25, it tells us about not forsaking the assembly of belief. That's what this is. And we're not to forsake that. Now, taking that in its Greek context, forsaking means to desert or abandon or to leave behind. Do not forsake the assembly of gathering together. Do not abandon that. Do not forsake that. Do not leave that behind. But there's so many people all across the country that have done just that. They have forsaken the church. They have forsaken that time of corporate worship as believers together. They have forsaken their area of service within the church. They have forsaken their families they're not even taking their kids to church anymore where once they used to. And what does that mean? Bottom line is ultimately they have forsaken the Lord. And as I see that, and as I look at Hebrews 10.25, I see that as being a clear violation of God's word. Not forsaken the assembly of those. Now this is similar according to what we see here in the 20th chapter of Acts. Met on Sunday... And they had a long-winded preacher. I wish the Apostle Paul could come back and preach that sermon. I wonder how many people would still be here by midnight. Now, I did a, bit, a little bit of research here, and it looks like the Apostle Paul was going to leave them the next day. And, and part of that is mentioned right here. So he preached all the way to midnight. And this is the last sermon I'm going to get into you all. I want it to count. I, and apparently he had a whole lot to say. And he wanted to tell everything that he had to say. These disciples met together. And it appears to me that for the biggest part, except for the guy that fell asleep, fell out the window, they really wanted to hear the word of God. Now, why are you here today? Why do you come here every Sunday? Do you really come to hear the word of God? Tell me, do you? Yes or no? Now, if you're not here to hear the word of God, and then your purpose is wrong, okay? That should be first and foremost. That should be the chief reason why we're here, to hear the word of God. There was that longing. Now, folks, that's the kind of people that I like to preach to. Those that want to hear the word of God, those that have a longing, the ones that could not care less what time it is. And I've been here long enough, I pretty much know which ones they are. You know, you preach 15 minutes, that's enough. You go after that, it's too long. I've had some of you all to tell me, I don't care how long you go. You just preach the word, I'm here to hear. I'm here to hear the word. Are you? Are you really here to hear the word? 
Because, see, I really believe that there are those that really do want to hear the word, and that's very important to them. And what is more important to them is not only hearing the word, but knowing how, once they have heard the word, to take it and apply it to their own lives. If you just hear it, and it goes in one ear and out the other, and you don't apply it, then I don't know that my time has been very effective, or yours. But making application of God's word. But as I look at the whole picture of things these days, I think those kind of people are getting fewer and farther between. In many churches, they just can't wait for the service to get over. Their favorite part of the service is when I say, and in closing, or the amen on the closing prayer, because they can't wait to get out the door and do all the rest of the things that they have on their list that day. One pastor that was an avid sports fan said that he gave up on sports. Here's the reasons why. Every time I went to a sporting event, they asked for money. The people with whom I had to sit with really weren't very friendly. He said, the seats were too hard and they really weren't that comfortable. He says, I went to too many games, but the coach, I went to all these games and the coach never did come by to call on me. Or the referee made a call that I just didn't agree with. I suspected that I was sitting with some hypocrites, so I just stopped going to those sporting events. Or the people came to see their friends and what they were wearing and they really didn't come to see the game. Then there's some games that went overtime, and I just couldn't stand that, and I wanted to go home. Or the band played so many numbers that I'd never heard before. It seems that it just took too many games. I was taken to too many games by my parents when I was growing up. And I don't want to take my children to any ball games because they ought to be able to make the choices for themselves what sports they want to go to. Now, you don't hear too many like that. You'll hear those excuses in church. But you won't hear that about ball games, will you? Um, don't get me wrong. I love ball games. I go to them all the time. I'm just saying that to say this. So many times we fail to recognize the importance and the privilege that we have of gathering together in this assembly to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And every time I say that, I think about that time when I was in Iran. <laughs> we didn't have the privilege to get up on a Sunday morning and worship. We didn't even mention the name God. So it's a privilege, it's an opportunity that we take for granted. Then we also see the apathy among God's people. We see it here. But there's a lot of apathetic people here in our own day and time. Now, Eutychus literally fell out of church. He fell out of the church window. He was sitting there in that window sill. Now, if Eutychus could fall asleep sitting in that window sill with the powerful preaching of the Apostle Paul, well, maybe I don't feel too bad when one or two of you all might snore during the middle of the service, okay? And in 27 years, that's probably not happened more than five or six times that I'm aware of, okay? I may not hear the snoring up here from where you might be. Now, in looking at this passage here, I have worked out a little outline here. There's the dozing that took place here with Eutychus. And then there was the declining of his own spirituality. And then we see where he fell from the third floor of that assembly building. We'd call it a church. And he was dead, but was brought back to life. Now, I certainly don't want to uh, forget those regular attenders. But I think that something that is very important here Yes, Eutychus might have been a regular attender, but you can, be a, you can be in church in body, but not really in spirit. 
If we're counting numbers, then yes, your body is a number. Your body counts. But are we really here to worship? Are we really here to be challenged and inspired and motivated and to make a difference for the cause of Christ? Are we here to be further equipped to be a greater witness out there in the community? Or are we just here showing up? See, I believe that we take the opportunity to assemble together for granted. We can get slack on our work around the church. And we don't put the emphasis on outreach that perhaps we need to put on. Maybe you start missing the Wednesday night Bible study. You start missing Sunday school a little. You start missing Sunday night services. And then, before you realize it, you're being sporadic in your Sunday morning worship. And then you wake up one morning and you realize you're just like Eutychus. You have fallen out of church. You were sleeping spiritually. You were being sung this lullaby by the world or Satan himself. And then you just fell out. Then after dozing, there was this declining. And I really see those going hand in hand. The dozing and the declining, okay? When I'm talking about declining here, I'm really speaking about your own spiritual life after you get out of church. If you're not in church on a regular basis, I mean, it just works this way, okay? You start declining. I don't know how many people over the years I've heard say, now, I don't have to be in church to be a Christian. No, no, I'm, I'll agree with that. You don't have to be in church to be a Christian. But when you look at Hebrews 10, 25, and that is a consistent thing, that I see that as being an open rebellion against God's word. Forsaken the assembly of God's people here. And have you ever known anybody that really lived a successful life for God that was a great witness for God? that wasn't in church, that wasn't a part of the teachings and the fellowship of the church. See, we see in the Gospels that it was very important to Jesus that he went to his father's house regularly. Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple when he was eight days old. You'll see that in the second chapter of Luke. And when the days of Mary's purification had taken place according to the law of Moses. When that had been accomplished, they, they brought baby Jesus to Jerusalem and they presented him to the Lord. Mary and Joseph went to the temple and every year they went to the feast of the Passover. And then we notice on two separate occasions where Jesus went and cleansed the temple. See, it was very important for the Lord to be in his father's house. Now, if it was important for him, don't you think that it is equally important for us? When people get out of church, I'm convinced they begin to decline spiritually. They begin to do things that once they would never do. I've heard stories. I've heard confessions of people, all because I got out of church. Slowly, little by little, I got out. And I know a couple that would say, I got out of God's will, and now my life is a mess. All because of what started a long time ago, and it took its effect. It took a toll. So when you don't attend church, you're missing out on discipleship. We have a men's discipleship class that meets here every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. There ought to be a whole lot more men involved in that. We miss out on the church fellowship. And I say this time and time again, and you heard Brother Ronnie say that this week. You know, we have a great fellowship around here, but if the devil can ever attack the fellowship, and he tries to do that, then eventually he can get us where he wants us, and it starts with that fellowship. 
and we get out of that corporate worship. Now, we all have loved ones that have fallen out of church. And I'm not saying that they're not saved. I'm just saying they're not where they once were. And, and you look at where they once were in the life and their effectiveness in the church, and then you see where they are right now. How do you know that's not going to happen to you if you're in that spiritual law right now? Where will you be spiritually two years from now, three years from now, five years from now? If you continue at the same pace, if you're going downward right now. In fact, you might just have to look in the mirror. And that's all you have to do is look in the mirror and see someone that's on a spiritual decline. And then you see, after the dozing and after the decline, you see the dying. And I'm not talking about somebody losing their salvation here. I'm just talking about a person's spiritual condition that has gotten to the point where spiritually they're dead. There's no life in them. You have gone from being a witness for Jesus Christ to a stumbling block. That can happen. There's no joy in your salvation. You are no longer fit to be used for God's glory. People look at you, they look at us at what we claim to be and then see the fruits that we do not have and see our actions. And they think, well, I really don't need Jesus if that's what Jesus is all about. And they see a hypocritical lifestyle in us. Now let me close out by saying, there is the core of the church. Those are the people you can always count on being here. They're here Sunday after Sunday. I can always count on them being here. And they, they take time out for the Lord. They're always here. They give of their time. They give of their talents. They give of their tithes. Those things are very important. I am thankful for the core of the church. But we need a greater core in this church and in any church. You know, it's easy to come revival and say, you know, I'm going to really get excited. I'm going to get involved in church. I'm going to be more faithful. But if you're not attending to the things that you need to do and being a part of the assembly of the church in corporate worship, my guess is that that commitment that you made back in November really won't be very much come February or March. It's a continuous thing that we have to do and stay upon every day. Staying in God's word. Staying involved in the church and the ministry of the church. Thank you for your commitment to the church. Let's pray. My blessing for each of you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. Amen. It takes me back to several years ago. I'm guessing 18 to 20 years ago. It was on a Sunday afternoon. And I had a funeral at the funeral home that is now City Hall. And I can remember the funeral directors there telling me that the burial was going to be.